This podcast is sponsored by All Alaska Outdoors. Looking for the ultimate fly fishing adventure in Alaska? Then try the best with All Alaska Outdoors. All Alaska Outdoors offers anglers and hunters many different packages to suit their angling and hunting needs. In 2019, the Fly Fishing Insider had the opportunity to visit All Alaska Outdoors and experience the hospitality and adventures. We fully endorse this lodge. But see for yourself at allalaska.com. Again, that's allalaska.com. Welcome to the Fly Fishing Insider Podcast. I'm your host, Greg Keenan. This is Season 3 of the Fly Fishing Insider Podcast. In this episode, we aim to bring you the biggest and best stories from those who work and make our fly fishing industry truly great. The Fly Fishing Insider Podcast dives deep into the past, present, and future of all our guests, uncovering their amazing stories and journey. Join us each week as we interview a new podcast guest. Also, if you're new to the show or not yet a subscriber, make sure you hit subscribe after this episode. Welcome to the Fly Fishing Insider Podcast. Today, our guest is Alex Scott. She is the Digital Com- Communications Coordinator for Scotty Plastics out here in British Columbia. So, Alex, thank you very much for being with us today. I know um, you are about to give birth probably in the next hour or two. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, hi, Greg. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, yeah. if I sound out of breath at all, I might be, you know, keeled over, potentially, uh, you know, having some contractions. So pardon that. <laughs> That's crazy. No, I, I we can't thank you enough. So definitely uh, Scotty Plastics on the show. Um, just really quickly, I always like to do this with the guests and I'll do this with you as well. Uh, what is your, your role, affiliation with Scotty and how you got involved with Scotty? Yeah, so I am um, a third generation Scott family member. So currently working remotely and handling our digital communications. So social media and some online marketing. Um, I've worked for the company uh, on and off for a good portion of my life in an array in multiple departments. Um, I've been very passionate about, uh, like I grew up sort of naturally just passionate about the ocean, bodies of fresh water, sustainable sport fisheries, um, I've always been involved with fish enhancement and volunteering in, in that um, category um, and stream restoration, but uh, especially fly fishing for the last, um, for, for a handful of years. So I recently got more involved with fly fishing um, as it truly just sort of sparked my interest, um, mainly wading and fishing from a kayak or small watercraft mm-hmm. roughly about eight years ago or so, I'd say. Um I started to take casting lessons from a professional and learning how to tie the odd salmon and steelhead fly. Um, And I grew up just uh, enjoying, you know, as a child, creative arts and dance and whatnot. And I think, you know, no pun intended, but the whole art of casting um, really drew me to this method of fishing and how organic, you know, entomology and fly presentation is and and uh, it's just so different from gear fishing. And I love that it introduced me to just, you know, so many different anglers and purists, so to speak. So um, that are not only just chasing the fish, but they, you know, have that drive to keep, whether it be perfecting their casts and mending techniques and presentations and sometimes just for, you know, the pure self-satisfaction aspect of it. So I think a lot of people can relate to that, that when they're out fly fishing, it's, you know, and same with, you know, gear fishing, but it's not just the catching of the fish that is getting you out there. There's so many other aspects to it and, and things to enjoy. So, but um, yeah, there's something about, you know, presenting a fly that you've tied or, while making a difficult cast that you've practiced and then watching that fish come up and strike your fly while, you know, playing a fish on your favorite rod and reel, or maybe it's even a custom made one or, um, hold some sort of special value to you. And, and, uh, there's just something so different about landing that fish, whether it be a tiny, you know, brook trout or a giant Chinook salmon on a fly rod and reel. But, but, um, yeah, so basically, I mean, back in 1952, which is, you know, gosh, how many years is that now? <laughs> a number of years. But yeah, yeah. Um, my, my grandfather, Blaney Scott, um, so my, my dad's dad, um, who was a former commercial fisherman, um, he was an ocean lover, angler, boat builder. Um, he was even an, a, a marine engineer. He started a small company in Victoria, British Columbia, 
And it was right near the harbor front, like right downtown Victoria, um, with his wife, my grandmother, Almeida Scott. So this basically pioneered, like they pioneered the use of plastics in the manufacturing of salmon fishing lures and other marine products. Um, my grandfather was the first, he, he really was the first to see like a need and to create plastic fishing plugs, like like uh, saltwater fishing mm-hmm. plugs. Um, and this was all just when plastic molding was really becoming a thing. So he was quite the, as my dad said yesterday, he was quite the science nerd. So he was always interested in, you know, how things worked and, and the chemistry of things and, and whatnot. So he really saw that the wooden fishing plugs yeah. would tend to get waterlogged. So he designed and molded some out of plastic. And uh, he, he built, along with, with um, another family member and some friends, he built a custom molding machine. And this thing was, it stands around eight feet tall. It was strung together with an array of parts, like including <laughs> aircraft mechanical pieces and miscellaneous components, you name it. Um, and the first-hand machine still stands in our front reception entrance at Scotty Today, which we're now located out in um, Sydney, British Columbia, on uh, you know the south of Vancouver Island. And so this machine is known as Old Number One. It has a big wooden plaque on it, and um, that sort of you know it's a humbling piece of heritage that we have right at our front door. And and obviously we're not giving tours right now, but when we do, people really enjoy seeing that. So, um, but yeah, he, he taught his kids. So my dad included how to, you know, mold and slice the leg strips off of little soft plastic hoochies and, and, uh, some of which some of our items can still be found, you know, today in the Royal BC museum in Victoria. I'm not sure if you've been there, but, um, so, But however, he did venture past the smaller tackle items, especially when people began to also dive into this market. Um, You know, everyone sort of started to want that piece of the pie. And so shortly after manufacturing these smaller tackle, like saltwater tackle items, he came out with things like our first Scotty uh, landing net or or you might have seen it, a blue sidewinder rod holder um, with metal and blue plastic. And and then our sort of original blue, it was called the Saltair downrigger. And that's sort of, yeah, our iconic original first ever manual downrigger. And, and um, yeah, but definitely started from humble beginnings. Um, literally, they started out selling out, you know, selling the odd fishing item up and down Vancouver Island with their firstborn child in tow in their station wagon, um, who's my uncle Ian, like he would have been one at the time, and just bombing up and down the island selling the odd fishing tackle and fishing tackle item. And um, But the, yeah, Scotty Manufacturing has rapidly evolved, you know, to produce thousands of products under the... Uh, Scotty trademark, which are now sold, as you know, into the fishing, marine, and outdoor, and and even firefighting industries. Not a lot of people know that, but we have a a complete. Alex, we're going to jump jump into that, Alex. um, Yeah, into into that stuff. I just want to touch base on really quickly. It's kind of funny you mentioned that. So, like, I always love the history of of a a company, and when you look at it, like you mentioned, he was selling these plugs. Were the plugs obviously they were West Coast focused? So that's Scotty has a huge huge West Coast roots and uh in history um within the west coast um you mentioned nets as well like you guys were yeah different landing nets so he would make um like initially out of plastic we do now currently offer a more of like a a larger fish or salmon Mm -hmm. landing net that is actually out of aluminum um but he had some nets with the hoops and whatnot that were out of plastic and and um all sorts of different items we tons like even though he started to dive into the the different um types of rod holders and and um I'm trying to think what some of the really, really old stuff. I mean, he still would make the odd tackle bit along with some of the bigger items, but that just sort of evolved. I mean, some people might, um, some of the old relics, like one of the names is called um, the Scotty Squid Devil. Like that was sort of a uh, hoochie style tackle item. We have um, different little holders that were... um, kind of like teaser heads that would hold strips of bait and just all sorts of different, um, you know, at the time, very innovative small Mm -hmm. tackle items. 
Um, <clears throat> but like I said, as more and more people got into the plastics industry and, and then stuff, you know, starting to happen offshore and whatnot, um, as you know, with your past and, and making some items, it's, it's hard to, you know, get that you know, piece of the pie and, and it can, you know, be very time consuming for the amount that, you you know, your return on investment. So, so, um, he, yeah, started to sort of shift his focus on some of the bigger items. And, and then obviously, you know, a lot of West coasters and what we're known for with the downriggers and trolling items. Um, he did really start to dive into that and focus his time and energy on that. And, and, uh, and then down the road, obviously getting into our first ever electric downriggers. But I mean, back in the day, it's like you needed a doctor's note just to switch from a, well, a yeah. manual downrigger to an electric. So that's, yeah, that's, let's, let's talk about that. Let's talk about those early day downriggers. I mean, I think those are fantastic. And I, I mean, I know so many people, myself included, you, you know, when you went 80 feet down or more, like it was, you felt it. Was that, totally. Was and I mean, it's still, <laughs> we still sell and obviously currently manufacture mm-hmm. all of our, um, uh, upgraded, of course, but all of our different lines of, of manual downriggers and, um, compact manuals. And now we, over the last couple decades, we even offer our smaller little leg troller downriggers. And, and I mean, they're all just as effective as they were back then. Mm-hmm. And, and they work just as great today. Um, but I mean, when it comes to like, there's a difference between, you know, running the smaller gear and and whatnot for for the freshwater lakes and whatnot um, versus when you're out you know you can be out trolling offshore here on the west coast in 300 400 feet of water like you said so the the, the shift to electric um, was was huge and uh, just it opened up you know a whole new door and and whole new uh, can of worms so to speak as far as what people could could get out there and target um without a you know commercial fishing troller basically so um and and my grandpa's uh history in the commercial fishing I think that sparked a lot of that and he saw that need for you know at the time like times were tough for his family too and he would take out his kids and out they lived right near Dallas Road which is in Victoria he would pack my dad in their little rowboat and my my dad, you know, maybe being four or five years old would have his fishing line on a little, you know, I want to say twig, but almost like a little, just a, just a what do you call it, a little dowel or whatever. Yeah. And they would just, you know, a couple hours before dinner while, you know, my grandmother was hanging back at the house uh, with the other four children, they'd be out catching, you know, black sea bass and stuff and, and bringing those back home for, to make some little bass cakes and whatnot for dinner. So, so yeah, like back in the early fifties, I mean, times were tough and he also, he, I think that drove and he saw that need to, you know, enable people to get out there um, and start trolling up salmon and, and start to be able to encourage that mm-hmm. whole local sport fishery. And, and, um, I, yeah. it absolutely did. It opened up the West Coast sport fishery. And I mean, totally. he, he, there's not one guide boat in, in BC that doesn't have, um, like a downrigger, uh, you know, whether it's a Scotty or not. I mean, that's just what they have, right? You, yeah. You, and I mean, obviously, especially out East, like you can run, mm-hmm. I don't know if you know, um, what I'm referring to, what I'm referring to when I say like a dipsy diver, but yes, you yeah. can run other ways, obviously, to get your line down and weights and whatnot. But, but no, I mean the use and um, and yeah, the use of of you know electric downriggers, it just completely shifted yeah. and changed and set a different course for so, for the sport fishing so how many and, and anglers. So, how, Alex, how many models of downriggers do you guys currently offer? We're sitting around 15 to 16 different models right yeah. now, and, and that has fluctuated, like I've said. So, um, And this includes our three different currently offered um, high-performance downriggers, so the, the latest electrics that have been around, gosh, I want to say almost for a decade already now. But And then our previous um, but still updated and, and out on the market nowadays are depth power electric downriggers. And then... Um, scaling back to the manuals we've got our manual downriggers our compact so smaller uh, manual downriggers and then our lake troller downriggers so yeah we have 
yeah, we have quite a few different models of those. And then, um, I mean, some of them are, it's still the same, you know, bodies, but they just have different rod holder and, and base, you know, options that go with it. Um, yeah, yeah, I want to I want to pr- talk about a quick little fact that we talked about off air um, really quickly, because, you know, with 15 models of downriggers, all with different, you know, components and whatnot, surprisingly, and I just learned this, um, you're not in the downrigging, like you're in the downrigging business, but that's not like, with 15 models. That's not your, your biggest. Component. Yeah. So yeah. like I've said, cause we have, and I might even be wrong now, but, um, the last time I checked, like we have hundreds of SKUs of products. So I, I want to say it's upwards of 400. So, um, we, yeah, like I, we were chatting before and saying how it really depends on demographics of what, you know, when, when someone's, throws around the Scotty name of what that person thinks um, we are known for or what we strictly make. And it is funny, like when you go to, you know, trade shows or speak with uh, anglers out on the West coast of BC or, I mean, even in Ontario and stuff, but if you talk to some of the sport fishing, um, you know, uh, anglers, they're going to, yeah, the first thing they're going to mention or, or spit out is, oh, yes, Scotty Downriggers. Like, I, I have their downrigger. Mm-hmm. And, um, but it's been funny because, yeah, over the last, you know, 20, 30 years, um, the, the bulk of our orders going out the door, like, we, we really have transformed into a, you know, rod holder business as well as, um, just countless accessories. And, um, I always like to refer to our company as it's, it's like Lego for fishermen because just we have so many items that, you know, they all kind of intersync and intersync and work together. Um, so if you start sort of like with one of our mounts, anything and any of our different items can kind of be added yes. on and ado- adopted from there. So, um, but yeah, it's it's really cool. So like I mentioned too, like you go to a trade show like iCast and people are going to, you know, point out one item and then they're going to be blown away when you show them the catalog and then they go, oh my gosh, you make downriggers and you do this and you do that. And, and then whether it be some people like talking to you in the fly fishing community and they're going to say, oh, I love your fly rod holder or I love your pontoon straps or I love this or I love that. And, and they might not have ever, you know, actively used or tested any of other our other gear um but uh yeah no it's it's always fun and interesting seeing you know what people what the first thing comes to mind when they when they hear the the name scotty and the brand scotty so because it's it's definitely different we we shipped over you know i think it's gosh it's got to be 35 or 36 different countries now so it's um yeah it's it's definitely transformed over the last 60 years I love how you call it like Lego for, uh, for fishermen. Um, yeah, it's well, really cause it's, cool. <laughs> and I always uh, being the social, you know, communicator or communications coordinator and, and talking with people, you know, I'm the first point of contact through our social media. It's always so funny when people want my opinion on something and they go, Hey, I have, uh, you know, I, I want to set up a camera and I want the camera mount and what base should I use? And I'm like, okay, well, here we go. Like it's this mm-hmm. huge, it, it just opens up this huge um, array of options for them because it depends like, what are they attaching it to? Do they want it to be flush? Do they want to have, you know, the ability to take their small watercraft out of the, uh, out of the launch after and have it be sleek with no, permanent fixed mounts there do they want stick on is it a pontoon is it this is it that so yeah it it really is neat um you know helping people figure out yeah exactly what you know scotty lego bits lego bits so to speak um all pieced together to to meet their needs like we we really have stuff for everybody well let's talk about that design process before (laughs) before we jump into the rod holders um themselves because i am going to ask like what's the most popular model and all that but um you know, let's talk about the design process and how you guys intricately and like you, you mold and make all those pieces and the thought goes into it. Doesn't matter what it is. Like I, you know, um, like you said, everything fits together and it's just super cool how that happens. Um, how is that done? Like who's doing that? What's the R and D on that? Yeah. So, I mean, we, so I'll just sort of, um, skip back a little bit here. Like obviously, family business for over 60 years like we've like 
grown from that local BC company to operating and shipping worldwide. So the company is situated, like I said, near near Victoria and Sydney, near the airport. We're currently in about an 85,000 square foot manufacturing plant. Um, and everything, which just doesn't happen nowadays, everything is all under one roof. Every employee that we have, everything from the idea of an item, like the concept, to design, to tooling, to uh, in our tool room, to you know working with our designers and rolling that out into the manufacturing side of things, to assembly, um, to sub assembly, to packaging, to shipping, and our our sales teams, our inside sales teams, our accounting office and reception and and everything. It's literally all in that one building, which just is very rare nowadays. Um, very. Very rare. Yeah, and what I love too is we still, you know, are a little bit old school that when you phone us and you've got a question, like we actually have a receptionist to pick up the phone. And I used to do that job as well. And and that always, you know, it almost freaks people out because they're expecting a robot or, you know, a call center, so to speak. So that's something that I've always been really proud about that we you can phone us with a question and, and a fishing or, or parts related question and actually talk to a human being, which is very cool. Um so, yeah, that building, like we recently expanded, it was about 60,000, now it's 85, um, but that was built back in the year 2000, So, um, which unfortunately, my grandfather didn't live to see the completion of that build. He literally passed away when we were, uh, I think they were cutting ground for it. Um, but we typically employ, like, I think we're just shy of about 100 people right now. Um, we continue to offer employment to Vancouver Island, you know, locals. Mm-hmm. Something my grandfather was also really passionate about, like, over over robotics and excessive machinery. Like, um, we've adapted and modernized over the years with, you know, newer packaging equipment and updated CNC tool machines. And um, we have over a dozen plastic injection molding machines, and they vary in size. But something, yeah, like I said, keeping some things old school, whether it be the receptionist at the front end. Um, uh, but, yeah, just just being able to employ people and and, because a lot of the stuff that we do, we could, you know, technically transition into having less, you know, people employed and, and that's just not, who we yeah, are no, and we want not, our stuff yeah, to, exactly. yeah. And like you said, with, when it comes to R and D, like having, having people, um, actual human beings like there and doing quality control and all this kind of stuff, like it all adds up. And, um, but, um, yeah, sorry. And I'm, I'm totally having a pregnancy moment here. I'm, I'm skewing away from your initial question, <laughs> but, as, um, as long as we're not going into labor, we're good. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, yeah. I'm, I, uh, often, you know, I'm prone to going off on these tangents right now with my, my baby brain here. Um, but, um, yeah. So like I said, though, from start to finish, I mean, it, it's pretty cool to see how everything is all done in this one building and, mm-hmm. and it, you know, it, it keeps things close knit and tight too. And, and the ability for, you know, our sales team, whether they, you know, are talking to a customer one day and, and they've got a idea or maybe a change that needs to happen to one of our items and they can physically go walk down to our project manager and to our tool room manager and have those discussions and in real time make those changes. And, and obviously, um, I mean, every company, um, has its, you know, ups and downs or, or an item might have a, a faulty hiccup in it after it's been launched or whatever. But the fact that we can actively make those changes on the fly and fix things and sort of knit them in the bud, so to speak, and, and whatnot is really cool just because we're, you know, all still under one roof and, and all manufactured here locally exactly. on the island. So And, you, you know, yeah. you guys are doing great things. You're employing 100 people so on and so forth right um you know keeping it in canada which is great so totally um, yeah so besides literally i want to say a bag that we put is it the bag there's there's probably only three items that literally are not manufactured all in 
Sydney, BC, under that roof. So um, that's something that we're very proud of, and you and be. to yeah. be able to yeah stamp yeah. our items saying yeah. made in Canada and and um, and or manufactured from from scratch in Canada. So that's and very cool. I tell you, as a Canadian, I don't see the made in Canada s- like symbol too much anymore. Right? So. Yeah, you definitely yeah. don't see it enough. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So that's really neat. So when we talk, um, so let me ask you, let's jump into to rod holders, the bulk of your business. What's your, what's your most popular model? Like what's where, like, is there a shift? Like, is there, do you find that, you know, guys in Florida are using this guys in the West coast are using that. And then obviously us fly fishers are using um, like a different uh, rod holder altogether. So what is, you know, like, is there a demographical like, demand on a specific product or is it just like yeah i mean and it's funny yeah. like even just as we speak i think things are changing so much um i would say for a long period of time like one of our most sort of i'd say value priced uh general rod holder on a global scale would have probably been our power lock rod holder just because it accommodates different types of uh, rods and reel setups um, but definitely, like you said, like each rod holder um, really pertains to obviously what you're targeting, what what type of boat are you on, what demographic are you in and whatnot. So um, I know like out here, obviously, when it comes to the West Coast and, and sport fishing side of things, you're going to be using um, – stuff like our rocket launcher rod holders on the downriggers. You're going to be using our orca rod holder and our striker rod holder and, and all those heavier based saltwater, you know, salmon and larger bottom mm. fish rod holders. Um, and simply, obviously, because they're they're the workhorses and, and, and you're needing those bigger structured rod holders. And, and having said that, whether it be, you know, a, a person out in Florida or whatever that still is, you know, targeting larger species of fish, like they're going to be using the, the bulkier ones as well. Um, and then diving into, you know, the, the fresh water, which we're really starting to get into that the last few years, we've really seen a growth in that. We're also really, you know, we're conscious of, you know, just North America as a whole and what's going on when it comes to, you know, sustainable sport fisheries and whatnot. And, and especially this year with, you know, COVID and everything going on, like there's, there still is more and more push for a lot of people to, you know, you don't need to spend a ton of money to get into some of these more um, smaller scale freshwater fisheries, right? Mm-hmm. Like you can get out in a, whether it be a pelican kayak or whatever, and you can um, get out onto these smaller watercrafts and with a lower, smaller budget and, you know, throw on a, a, whether it be an electric trolling motor or even just simply paddle and use some of our accessories um, we we still manufacture things like oar locks and and uh, different things for even just rowing boats and whatnot. So to be able to get out onto these you know freshwater bodies of water and uh, and promoting that whole fishery like that's so huge and and people have been able to get out even this past year and and uh, get out and fish and enjoy the outdoors and get some fresh air and and um, yeah so we have obviously tons of different rod holders and accessories for um, the whole freshwater side of things too. Right. So, um, but something that's been exciting this past year that we've been literally dreaming up and tooling for a number of years now, but obviously, as you know, the the new R5 universal rod holder. Um, So that has opened up, um, you know, such a fun opportunity to be able to, for people to even just invest in this one rod holder for their, whether it be, you know, kayak or, or small watercraft. Um, and that's going to accommodate pretty much all the arsenal that you have. It, even if, you know, you want to be fly fishing one day, as long as you've got, I think it, I think at the bottom of your fly rod holder or your fly rod just needs to be a quarter, maybe about a half inch to an inch of a butt on the, on the actual fly rod itself to accommodate it. Um, and then, like you said, we still obviously have our fly rod holder, which is totally tried and tested and loved by a ton of people. Um, but yeah, you're going to be able to pick up one of these R5 rod holders and whether you're, you know, fly fishing one day, trolling your flies or just simply using it as a rod rest. Um, but it accommodates, you know, four other types of rods and reels, which is really awesome too. So um, if, if somebody, 
you know, had never heard about Scotty items and was just getting into fishing and wanted to, you know, go out in a little belly boat or a pontoon boat or kayak or this, this canoe or whatever. Yeah. This would be the holder. Yeah. If you, if you wanted to, you know, you know, not dive in head first and, and pick up a couple little gear items and, and whatnot, this is definitely, uh, going to, uh, going to work well, for, for that angler, but, um, and it's got the quick release, right? So it's, totally. You know, yeah. Like for, so for these chronomic guys or, or indicator fishers, like still water indicator fishing out here in BC, like, like I do, um, that that's like game changing. You are going to, you know, we're all talking yeah. about it. We all can't wait till, uh, to get the ice off the, the lakes here and start using these for the, this spring coming up for. for yeah. And back. having said that, I just shared, you know, yeah. one of our, um, pro staff, uh, picks today of him and his wife out ice fishing with this R5 rod holder too, that they've literally just got mounted down to a, to a little piece of, uh, plywood yeah. and, yeah, and they're so. using that too. Cause it's, it's, perfect rod rest but again if you're you know wanting to take a break from jigging or whatever and and uh they're like you said super quick release it's literally just got this quarter inch um stainless steel lock bar that pivots and allows for yeah quick effortless release of the rod basically so um and you're able to adjust the tension um with just you know two what is it two number 10 screws it says yeah so um depending on, you know, how, Mm -hmm. how easy you want that bar to be able to, to unlock. But, but, um, you know, yeah, it's it's, it's huge. It's actually, it's going to do well. I'm thinking about the Sturgeon guys, you know what I mean? In the Fraser there, they're just going to love it as well. Um, Totally. Yeah. And it's, it's really sort of, it's interesting to see how, you know, you can kind of do these full circle Mm -hmm. um, moves where it's kind of like stripping things down, so to speak, back to the basics. Like it, it is one of those rod holders that's, um, I mean, it, not that it's not complicated, but like to manufacture, but it, it really is, you know, getting back down to just like people just want that to be able to just pick it up and not have to deal with the silicone straps and this mm-hmm. and that. Exactly. And, exactly. and yeah. so it yeah. really is, you know, going back to the basics, so to speak. So, and we did a number of years ago offer, um, something basically it was just called a rod rest and we still make it today um and a lot of you know like you said uh for sturgeon fishermen they use that and because people want that non um what's the word i'm working i'm looking for they want that non like no interference right. when it comes to yeah. grabbing Confine, the rod for their confining. strikes right yeah, yeah. so it's, and yeah. it's good to obviously use like if you're going to do something like the rod bouncer or rod rest you're going to want to make sure you've you know you've got a a leash on your rod and whatnot. And you don't want, you know, more stories of stuff going overboard and that sort of thing. But, but so when it comes to, you know, a, a rod holder like this one, that offers a little bit more security there on, on that end, but, but you're still getting that, um, yeah, just effortless, you know, uh, release of your rod when, when that fish strikes or when you want to grab at it. So, no, absolutely. Yeah. So I, I'm excited. Like I mentioned, I'm excited to use that for sure. So, um, you know, you, you mentioned the R, the R5. Uh, what else do you have that's new that's coming out or, or what's the direction that you, you know, you talked about earlier in the show, you talked about how, you know, the, the still water community or the, the fly fishing community, you know, we're sort of decking out our boats and that, that whole demographic has shifted and we're, you know, we have newer technologies of, of screens and, uh, you know, totally. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. like, like I said, like, I mean, so, so, uh, we, we've become, you know, known for our rod holders and accessories and definitely exactly that. Like just, we're just knocking out accessories after accessories and, and different mounts that just, you know, make the, um, make people just have that many more choices when it comes to how they want their setup. So again, back to the whole Lego for fishermen thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, when it comes to, I mean, I got to be careful. I'm trying to put my fly fishing brain on here with, with this fly fishing podcast, but, but, um, when it comes to the, the holders and accessories and mounts, um, definitely you're going to see, see a shift in focus on a lot of the different, um, ball mounting systems, like offering the different, just infinite adjustability. Um, uh, another huge thing over the last few years has been, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with, if you've ever run a kayak or small boat with the track systems, mm-hmm. but we have all sorts of different, um, uh, we manufacture our own Scotty track, but we have 
uh, countless different ball track adapters that then um, enable you to, to drop and lock different items on top of those. Um, so, yeah, and then we have, you know, an array we just came out with. They also use the similar ball mount um, system, like the the center of it, but different types of um, fish finder holders. And, and we have our transducer mount, which is relatively new still. And, and that, um, again, more targeted towards the smaller yeah, like I said, course, the watercraft, yeah, yeah. pontoons, flow that, tubes, all that kind of stuff. But that's a growing so market, right? Like that's it huge. really yeah. is. Like, yeah. And um, so, yeah, definitely just more and more accessories along those lines, whether it be um, holding electronics or um, still just different ways to access and mount your rod holders. Um, there's, it, it really, like I said, it really depends on what you are sitting in, like whether you're in a kayak or a, you know, a rowboat, a canoe, like we have everything from um, like gunnel mounts. So you can just simply, you know, uh, screw on one of our, our gunnel mounts and then it has a gear head. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but a gear head top to it. Yeah. And again, you can drop in basically any Scotty item, whether it be a rod holder or an accessory, most of them come with what we call a post mount. So just that black, literally it is just oh, a post yeah, yeah. that drops and locks into any um, base, like any mount or any time you see one of those gear heads, which they, you kind of twist the top ring cuff of it. Um, and then drop and lock in anything with a post like that all works together. So, mm -hmm. so it's, um, yeah, whether it be, you know, uh, a fly angler, let's say in a belly boat or a pontoon and, and they, want to troll with your fly rod and you might be, you know, using flippers. Well, um, somebody might want to use one of our glue on mounts with then a couple height extenders or, or maybe a, a pontoon strapped mount, but, but utilizing the different extenders to get that elevation off of the water line. Um, and then there would be parts like the gear head and whatnot up at the very top and, and allowing that angler to drop in and lock, whether it be the new rod holder or the, the tried and tested, um, you know, just our fly rod holder or whatnot for trolling. Um, but to, to be able to get, um, uh, to, to have your items more accessible to you. So, so yeah, that the whole, you know, there's a whole genre of just our height extenders and, and adapters to, to make everything. It's all about ease of use, right? Exactly. So if, yeah. if the gear is not, you know, doing its job about making your time on the water more enjoyable or more, um, you know, accessible and all that stuff, then, then there's no point to having it. So, so our sort of, you know, motto that we've also adapted besides obviously our, our, um, hashtag and slogan of the way to fish it really has been like fight the fish and not the fishing gear because we all know i mean and especially yeah, <laughs> me with fly fishing too you know you it's bad enough getting your lines tangled up sometimes but then having you know too much excessive other gear on board and it's like oh at what point does this you know make my life easier mm -hmm. and more enjoyable the the valued time that you have out on the water or versus uh oh is this just too much and i don't need it and and whatnot so we're always really mindful of the functionality and the what is the point of this and what is the purpose of it. So, but um, again, sorry, going off on a tangent here. It's easy to do so when we have so many items. And I'm well, uh, yeah, I just well, I love your passion. I love your passion about how you guys are and how how you know how much you care to to about the products that you guys are creating and how the brand is doing that. So, but yeah. with, that, with that said, I'm going to shift. So I'm going to shift to, you know, other, other aspects that you guys are doing within the community or within fisheries or something that you're supporting, you know, that we should know about that you guys are supporting or you guys are behind, um, you know, particularly here on the West coast. Is there any foundations or anything like that, that we should be aware of that with your involvement? Yeah. I mean, all oh, that too. We've always been, you know, huge, strong supporters of, um, I mean, a handful of larger organizations and nonprofits, whether it be, you know, Pacific Salmon Foundation and um, just all sorts of different freshwater, um, you know, fishery 
conservation efforts and and go fish bc and and uh but when it comes to yeah like all of the different organizations i mean oh my gosh like there's just so many we try we probably i would say try to you know tackle and and have proceeds and donate to more than just a few Mm -hmm. um and again because we're you know shipping and and become such a worldwide company um trying to you know scatter that support as far as we can um but yeah as far as more on the west coast i mean definitely we have always been you know pro fish enhancement efforts whether it be you know on a smaller scale with different volunteer organizations um we definitely support uh volunteer you know salmon hatcheries um i've been a um proud volunteer even just locally at uh, goldstream salmon hatchery for the last decade um going there weekly and and that's been really interesting and and Mm -hmm. fun learning how you know that whole side of things works and how we operate on a volunteer um basis but um yeah, no, as far as West Coast, I mean, Scotty has always been a huge supporter. Obviously, this year it's been tougher, but but a huge supporter of any type of local event and derby and whatnot. And, and typically that, I mean, sometimes in the form of cash, but a lot of the time in a form of product. And, yeah. and those derbies are going to be, you know, also to the entrance fees or whatnot are all going to be going usually towards, you know, something of benefit. Um and and that's another thing too. Like we really over the past few years, because um, obviously we do get quite inundated with with people uh, requesting for a product for events and and um, support and whatnot. So that's sort of which is something I'm proud of. That's definitely something that we take into consideration now. Like if it's not an event that really in any aspect is giving back, or we're sometimes a little bit more hesitant to supporting it. So. Um, we really like to work with people that uh, are hosting, yeah, different types of, of uh, whether it be tournaments or derbies that that uh, have a strong, you know, push and uh, and um, what am I trying to say? They, they, that they're going to be contributing in some sort of a positive way that that promotes whether it be you know sustainable fisheries and and fish enhancement and or um, whether it be uh, you know an event that's um, for youth and we're really strong with you know promoting obviously kids and and getting new people into the sport of fishing and and um but uh yeah yeah like oh sorry my brain's my brain's starting to (laughs) go off on a tangent here (laughs) i I guess i'm asking tough questions no i'm just kidding i'm just kidding no it's just yeah i mean at the end of the day it'll it'll want anything that aligns with scotty's values and i mean you guys are you know you're doing well um you know, with that, and you've support so much for sure. So, um, I did want to quickly touch base. Um, not too much on, but it just you mentioned earlier as well about the the firefighting products, and you're involved with that somehow. Yeah. So we Scotty has uh, how many years now? We have like if you go to just Scotty dot com, we do have a tab at the top that says mm. Scotty Firefighter. Um, it's not as much municipal. It's definitely all wildfire. Um, but I want to say we have been manufacturing Scotty fire products for, um, God, it's got to be over 30 years now, I'd say 25, 30 years. Um, but yeah, so that we have an array, an array of items from different types of backpacks to help, you know, people that are fighting wildfires go into, you know, the, go into the thick of all of it and do their job. So whether it be, um, different foam and gel systems, we, we manufacture all sorts of different nozzles, um, and all of these nozzles, um, the biggest, uh, I guess, key selling point of them too, is that a lot of these, um, people that are going out into the bush and fighting these, you know, especially BC wildfire or Canadian uh, wildfires, they um, sometimes are put in a situation where it's like, I mean, stuff happens really fast and they might have to back out of a certain area. Um, our, 
our products are like high vis, so they're a lot of them are bright orange and yellow and red. Um, but the the competition is a lot of the time really really heavy and made of metal. So um, I mean, worst case, if sometimes these guys have to bail out of a situation, like they they can kind of you know abandon ship, so to speak, mm-hmm. and these items are not costing thousands and thousands of dollars that they've now left in the bush somewhere. So, um, so that's a, a big key selling point. And, and it's funny because a lot of people say like, Oh, well, doesn't your stuff just melt and, and whatnot being that close to fire. But I mean, these, these plastics and resins have such high, high, high melting points that, yeah. that, uh, you would literally, the person would, you know, essentially be dead also if our stuff was melting. Right. So, mm-hmm. um, if they were that close to that close to yeah. stuff, but, but yeah, I mean, definitely like it's something to check out. I, I could go on forever about that whole awesome. side of things too. Yeah. But there's, there's all sorts of different, you know, um, adapters and, and spray nozzles and, and, um, different, even at home, like protection sort of things or like there's, um, we have something called the squall wall, which is essentially gets like hooked up to, um, different, hoses and, and fasteners and and is able to um, deliver like a fanned out spray against certain whether it be structures that you know might be in um, uh, a path of you know where uh, there might be wildfire or something happening and trying to protect that like structure mm-hmm. or whatnot and and um, but yeah all sorts of different just backpacks and whatnot that a lot of places just have just um, for safety measures within their building or whatnot too. So it's a, uh, yeah, whole, whole nother sector and, and huge line of items. And, and that's, um, I mean, my grandfather, I think he was really smart in, you know, venturing into that a little bit as time went down too, or time went, went by because he, he saw that, you know, um, what am I trying to say? He, he saw that growth, unfortunately, mm-hmm. in, you know, essentially the world burning through the summers, right? So he, he sort of entered into that whole thing um, as well, just to, to try and offer some more affordable and, and an, an array of different um, wildfire items too. So No, definitely. It, it's super cool. And protect those, you know, ecosystems and, and you know, yep. forests or surrounding the watersheds and rivers and all this and that. So it all, you know, is, still stems back to his you know, passion as well for just fishing. the natural world yeah. and fishing. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, so yeah, yeah but really, um, really cool. Really. And that's why I wanted to highlight that because I think it's worth mentioning for sure. So I, I also want to actually like five years from now, so you guys are 35 years in business, right? No, 50. Uh, oh no. Yeah. No. We're over what's, 60. Yeah. Well, the, I got to do the math here. My brain's just not firing on all cylinders. Today. Well, 50, but yeah, no, 52 is when you started, right? Mm-hmm. And so, really, I mean, I'd honestly, we say 52, it would have been 50, 51, but, 50. but 52 starting to make, you know, some of the items that, you know, we still, um, yeah. we, you could look at and it would still, you know, like, like the, a rod holder for instance yeah. or whatnot. So, um, yeah. So since, since 1952, yeah. So well over. So then here's my question then. What, what do you, where do you see the, the brand going, the, you know, the shift going in the next five years? Oh, you know what? De- definitely, like we sort of were talking about, definitely, um, and and keeping the firefighting thing aside mm-hmm. when it comes to paddle sports and and just the mm-hmm. our bread and butter of just Scotty fishing products. Um, definitely more and more freshwater fishery, yeah. smaller items. Um, the the downriggers, all of that stuff, it's never going to go away. But um, we definitely are really promoting we've seen that demand and that push for um yeah more i want to say smaller scale but it's a it's a huge scale but it's on a huge scale but but smaller items um for yeah getting people out there and and enjoying you know i think something that uh, north america in particular obviously we seem to do a pretty decent job i'd like to say it at uh you know stocking our freshwater lakes and and uh you know offering sustainable uh fisheries when it comes to the freshwater stuff right and obviously a strong push for you know 
fishing nowadays doesn't to everybody doesn't just mean going out you know catching a fish and bringing it home to eat there's you've got your whole other uh door with catch and release so we've got you know tons of people strictly using our gear um whether it be fly fishing or not gear fishing but strictly to get out there and and target just an array of different species um strictly for the fun of it and the hobby aspect of it too right so um yeah definitely i'd say the future is definitely I want to say for this company, it it is pushing towards freshwater for sure. And, and like I said, not trying to downplay the the Mm -hmm. saltwater aspect of things and, and that'll always be so huge. And, and, um, yeah, but, but when it comes to, like you said, like gross sales and where, you know, maybe some more of our R and D and, um, product, um, launches and, and concepts will be geared towards geared, uh, excuse me, geared towards, so to speak. Um, yeah, you, you'll definitely see more, more freshwater based rod holders, accessories and, and all of that. So different mm-hmm. items to make, you know, your like I said, your time out on the water, just more enjoyable. And well, we can't wait. So yeah, I, I, know, I know we definitely can't wait. So you know what, Alex, uh, we've learned, I've learned, uh, the listeners have learned so much about Scotty today on the show. Um, and I can't thank you enough for, for partaking in the, the podcast here just before you're about to go into labor. Um, yeah, and I apologize again. My brain, like I said, no, oh, my no, goodness. That's all good. There is something so, to be said for baby brain. That is legitimate, let me tell you. I'm just not firing on all cylinders the last few days. That's, that's good. In a few years, you can go back and listen to this episode again. And <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I'm going to be like, what did I say? I didn't make any sense. <laughs> that's too funny. So, you know what? With that said, I know, and I know you're going to be busy for the next little bit, but Scotty is a huge family, and someone will be taking over your role while, uh, while there. While we're there, if someone wanted to reach out to you and learn more about Scotty Plastics, get in t- contact with um, somebody from the, the company regarding sales or anything Scotty related, where would they find you at? Totally. So, I mean, the easiest thing is obviously just our main website, which is just www.scotty.com. I'm going to make sure I put all those details within our show notes. You know what, Alex? I want to thank you. I want to thank you guys, your family. I want to thank everything you guys are doing for the fisheries out here in British Columbia as well. So, um, listeners, I want to thank you guys. So, thanks. No, no, thank you so much. You've been listening to the Fly Fishing Insider Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, tell us by liking this episode and subscribing to the show. Also, don't forget to follow us on Instagram at Fly Fishing Insider Podcast. See you next week.